Hey, what's going on everyone? My name is Jonathan Riddell and today we will reignite the conversation about negative temperature. Today we'll focus on real world physical systems that have been shown experimentally to have negative temperature. In particular, we will look at uh, a very famous experiment carried out in the 1950s by Purcell and Pound. They carried out their experiment using lithium fluoride, which is pictured here, which is a solid. Before we get started, it's worthwhile to review briefly the definition of temperature in the two cases we expect for the entropy versus energy curve. We define one over the temperature as the partial derivative of the entropy with respect to the energy. We keep the volume and the number of participating bodies in the system constant. For the case of an isolated system at fixed energy, the entropy is naturally given as Kb, the Boltzmann constant, times the natural logarithm of the number of energetically accessible microstates. What this means is that we don't expect energies above or below our system's energy to contribute to the equilibrium properties of our system. There are a variety of reasons for this, one being if our system is indeed at some energy, energies far from our system's energy shouldn't contribute to the dynamics in any meaningful way. To see a natural explanation for this formula, check out our videos on entropy and Jane's principle of maximum entropy. Links in the description. In the last video, we spoke about two situations for the entropy. One being that the entropy would always increase with respect to increases in energy. This is intuitive. The more energy we have to distribute amongst particles, the more ways we can usually distribute it. An easy example uh, to think of would be that of the ideal gas. We know that the energy of a single particle in a cubic box with lengths L is given by the following formula. Here H is Planck's constant, M is its mass, and N1 through N3 are natural numbers labeling the different energies. If we imagine a large number of these particles in a box forming a gas, the number of ways one can distribute a given energy over all of these particles is usually quite big. The bigger the energy, the larger the number of choices we have. It's important to note that most degrees of freedom fall into this category. That is, most situations one might have in nature will always have positive temperature. This is contrasted with the case that entropy eventually decreases when we increase energy. This happens when we have a situation where the degrees of freedom in our system have a finite space to explore themselves. The example we gave was the quantum spin, which is a two-level system, meaning each individual spin can only have one of two configurations. Up until this point, however, this example has been completely abstract, so it is desirable to explore the Purcell and Pound experiment to showcase something a little bit more real. So before we jump into the Purcell and Pound experiment, it's worthwhile to note that this isn't the only way to achieve negative temperatures in nuclear spin systems. I chose this example because it's such an early example and I find it very intuitive. You can, for example, also achieve this, uh, this negative temperature for the same system using radio frequency techniques. I'd also like to note that I am, in fact, a theoretical physicist, not an experimentalist, so I apologize if this, exper uh, if this explanation is still quite theoretical, but hopefully it's also intuitive for you as well. The experiment in question is written about in a famous paper entitled A Nuclear Spin System at Negative Temperature. The authors study lithium fluoride, which again is a solid. Solids are organized into a lattice structure, which is pictured here. We can think of the balls on the lattice in this picture as atoms. In our example, the green is fluoride and gray is lithium. In this experiment, strong magnetic fields were applied to the material and will be the mechanism we use to arrive at a negative temperature. Spin is an intrinsic angular momentum carried by atomic nuclei and other particles and it interacts with the magnetic field. For this video, we will focus on the proton in the nucleus. However, there is certainly a magnetic moment for neutrons as well. The protons have a nuclear magnetic moment given by the following formula. Mu is a vector quantity because the magnetic moment must be described in all three spatial dimensions. 
In the formula, g is the g factor, which is roughly 5.586. It is a dimensionless quantity. Uh, Q is the charge and M is the mass. S is the spin angular momentum vector and it is a common observable in quantum mechanics. Therefore, we see that the magnetic moment for the proton is in the direction of the spin itself. The energy of the magnet magnetic moment in a magnetic field is given by the dot product between the magnetic moment and the magnetic field with a negative one out front. Here we can imagine the case, for example, where the magnetic field is pointed in the z direction, giving us the reduced equation given here. When a proton is put into a magnetic field, it tends to align its magnetic moment parallel to that field, thus pointing the spin parallel to that field. This is due to it being energetically favorable to do so. This fact will, be, uh, will become important soon. In this experiment, the energy of the nuclear spins is given by the following equation. The first term in, is the magnetic moment interacting with the magnetic field, which we are taking to be quite large. The second term is interactions between the spins themselves. Terms like these can usually come in two forms. Either the interaction favors the spins to be parallel or anti-parallel, but for our purposes, this doesn't really matter since we are working in a regime where the magnetic field will be large, making the magnetic field strength sort of the dominant player in how the spins will uh, uh, direct themselves. The third term is the interaction between the spins and the lattice itself, sometimes referred to as the spin phonon interaction or the spin lattice interaction. This interaction takes place due to the fact that our lattice isn't actually rigid. Each point will vibrate about its equilibrium point a little bit. The interesting point of lithium fluoride is that if we prepare our system in a small but positive temperature, the spin lattice interactions are actually quite negligible. The dynamics due to this interaction can take on the order of minutes or even hours uh, to relax to equilibrium or become important. The spin only dynamics on the other hand take less than a tenth of a second to relax to equilibrium. So if we perturb this system somehow, we see that two separate time scales exist. First, the time it takes for the spin-only portion to reach equilibrium, and much, much later, we get the second time scale, which is how long it takes for the spin-only system to reach equilibrium with the lattice. These two time scales are radically different. As we said, the spin lattice timescale is on the order of minutes or even hours, while the spin only portion of the energy relaxes to equilibrium far sooner, less than a tenth of a second. Therefore, perturbation or disturbance from equilibrium will inevitably give us a transient equilibrium regime. In this short period of time, we are left with a system that can be affected can, that can effectively only explore a finite amount of possible microstates since only the spin degrees of freedom are being explored. This therefore allows us to potentially have a system with negative temperature. With our time axis, we see that after waiting a short period of time, we enter into the spin-only equilibrium called the transient equilibrium. This, of course, is unstable in the long run. If one waits long enough, the spin portion of the energy must come to equilibrium with the spin lattice term as well, which due to the phonons or lattice vibrations will be forced into a space where increasing energy always increases entropy. So in this sense, a spin only equilibrium which can have negative temperature is unstable, but can last minutes or even hours. To maintain a negative temperature for an infinitely long time, we would need to fully isolate our finite configuration space from interactions with particles who have an infinite configuration space. But in reality, we are always exposing our finite configuration spaces to degrees of freedom who have an infinite amount of configurations to explore.
The simple experiment works as follows. First we prepare our lithium fluoride at a low temperature in a strong magnetic field. This allows us to write the energy effectively as the interaction of the field with the magnetic moment. Each proton's magnetic moment is then in the direction of the magnetic field, or at least most of them are. We then reverse the direction of the magnetic field very rapidly. If the switch was quick enough, the magnetic moment doesn't change its direction and is now in the opposite direction of the new magnetic field. This then corresponds to a higher energy state for the nuclear spins since the magnetic moment is anti-parallel with the field, or at least most of the magnetic uh, moments are anti-parallel with the magnetic field. To picture this result more intuitively, we can plot the results of the experiment. Since we are only concerned with the spin portion of the energy in the transient regime, we only have a finite number of configurations to explore, giving us a entropy versus energy plot like this seen here on the screen. This again is due to only the spins being important on this time scale. We prepared an energy state at low but positive temperature. The blue arrow indicates where our prepared system's energy lies on the entropy versus energy curve. Take note specifically of the fact that our our slope is positive, indicating a positive temperature. By flipping the magnetic field rapidly, but keeping the ma magnetic moment constant, we end up in a much higher energy regime. This then gives us a negative slope on the entropy versus energy plot, which then corresponds to a negative temperature. And there you have it, uh, a real world example of negative temperatures. And of course, this isn't the only example. Just recently, uh, potassium-39 atoms were shown to possess negative temperatures even when they were allowed to move around, i.e. Had, they had motional degrees of freedom. Negative temperatures are also required to explain some experiments uh, with, with many lasers. This list is not exhaustive, but the principle is always the same. If you have a system isolated in some way that only the degrees of freedom in the system, which have a finite amount of configurations to explore, then you can oftentimes find negative temperatures. Negative temperatures are required to explain the outcomes of numerous, uh, numerous uh, experiments. They are also a great first example of the exotic properties one finds in nature when using statistical mechanics to describe quantum regimes. So as we go forward, I will start to cover more and more topics in quantum statistical mechanics. If you have any suggestions or requests, uh, please let me know. As always guys, I hope this was interesting. If you liked the video, feel free to like, subscribe, and leave a comment below.